Um, it's absolutely lovely to have people together again in a room uh, for the beginning of our Gifford series for 2022. Um, my name's Dorothy Meal. I'm the head of College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. And it's a real pleasure to be here this evening to introduce our lecturer for the, for the year. The Gifford Lectures uh, have long been established. They were first set up in 1885 by a gift from Adam Lord Gifford. He was a justice of the Court of Session and a man of very great learning and broad interests. He endowed a series of public lectures to be held at each of the four ancient Scottish universities here at Edinburgh, St Andrews, Glasgow and Aberdeen. The lectures were to be for the promotion of the study of natural theology, with natural theology being defined very broadly as the knowledge of God and the foundation of ethics and morals. At the University of Edinburgh over the years, we've been delighted to have some very eminent speakers. We've had great thinkers such as William James, Henri Bergson, Albert Schweitzer, Iris Murdoch, Rowan Williams and Mary Beard. And so we come to the 2022 series, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Professor Susan Neiman. She's director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam. Initially born in Atlanta, Georgia, um, she studied philosophy at Harvard and at the Free Universität Berlin, and has been professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv universities. Her many books have been very widely translated into different languages. Some of the titles are Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, and Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists. <coughs> She's also published over a hundred essays and received very many awards. For example, the 2014 International Spinoza Prize, recognizing the excellence of her scholarship and the esteem in which she's widely heard. Held. I know we've been uh, eagerly awaiting Professor Neiman's Gifford series, and the theme is Heroism for a Time of Victims. This evening, we'll be hearing the first of her six lectures entitled Who Needs Heroes? And this will introduce the main themes of the series and discuss the history of modern writing of, about heroes and the 20th century turn to make the victim the main subject of history. I want to just remind everyone that the lecture this evening is being filmed and the video uh, will shortly be available online on the university's Gifford Le Lectures web pages. It's also joined there by a blog and we'll be f filming the seminar that will be held later in the week. But enough of the inter introductory material. I want to welcome Professor Susan Neiman to present the first of her Gifford Lectures. Susan. Thank you, Dorothy, um, for that kind introduction and um, thank you for the invitation. Everybody can hear me in the back too, yes? Okay. When I began to write these lectures a year ago, few thoughts seemed as obsolete as this one of Thomas Carlyle's. I'm quoting that hero worship exists, has existed, and will forever exist universally among mankind is the cornerstone of living rock whereon all politics for the remotest time may stand secure. Carla believed that the history of the world is the biography of great men, and few beliefs have come to seem more foolish in the intervening century and a half of historical speculation. Our attention has been turned from kings to peasants, from political systems to social movements, from men to women, even from people to things, as the role of cotton or steel or salt in shaping the world has been steadily studied. As historiographers declare that we live in a post-heroic age, popular culture has been determined to prove it. Though magical superheroes still draw crowds to the box office, more typical are the multiple, and often excellent, television series 
that reverse traditional heroic plots. Starting with the Sopranos, their finely drawn characters trace narrative arcs that go from bad to worse. For the young among their millions of viewers, other outcomes only take place in comic books. Surely Carlyle's claim that hero worship will endure as long as we do has simply been disproven by time. Nor is there need to wait for the 21st century. Just a generation after Carlyle, you didn't have to be Nietzsche to mourn the death of the hero. William James, for example, wrote an eloquent essay calling for future societies to establish a moral equivalent of war. He was a socialist as well as a pacifist, and not only at a distance. Two of his brothers were gravely wounded in the American Civil War. This is a picture of the first black regiment um, in the American Civil War in which one of his first integrated regiment, in which one of his brothers fought and was wounded. When James praised martial virtues, he knew what they cost. Still, he insisted that they were preferable to the hopes of his age, which he called a utopia for sheep and cattle, mawkish and dish, dish watery. Human life with no use for hardihood, he wrote, would be contemptible. Without risks or prizes for the darer, he wrote, history would be insipid indeed. The essay was written in 1906, and it might be tempting to ascribe it to a naivete the First World War would make impossible a few years later. Yet even as late as 1918, Thomas Mann would contrast the heroism of Germany with a civilization of security and flabbiness he saw in the Allies, whom he called a world of ants with insurance policies. Two months ago, I could have added a slew of choice quotes which seemed to kick Carlyle's claims into the dustbin of history. And suddenly we are living in heroic times. The admiration for Volodymyr Zelensky is not only international and explosive, it's been accompanied by something like a collective sigh of relief. Russia's attack on Ukraine is not, alas, the first illegal invasion of the century, but it's kept millions of distant observers riveted because it produced an old-fashioned hero. More than one commentator pointed out that Zelensky trained as an actor and knows how to play a part, but in fact he has qualities most heroic myths demand. His origins are obscure, at least unpromising. Jewish comedians are normally the subject of comedy. Called to unexpected trials, his determination to risk his life and describe why it matters have kept millions of Ukrainians determined to fight. As I write helpless words, thousands of Ukrainians defy calls to surrender by organizing resistance. Those who haven't joined the army are filling sandbags, baking bread to feed soldiers, bearing cultural treasures to preserve them, playing music or holding classes in the ruins of bombed out buildings. The thoughtfulness and unity under such conditions reveal not just the will to survival, but a commitment to living with spirit and stature. Meanwhile, millions of people who could barely find Ukraine on a map have been glued to their screens. Quickly enough, engagement outside the country can be ludicrous. The pizza parlor in my Berlin building displayed a sign reading, End War, Eat Pizza, in blue and yellow chalk. I should say that we've taken in thousands of refugees, and the, the Russians I know in Berlin in particular have done nothing else but care for them. Mm. But for most observers, <clears throat> the chance to think in heroic categories is a break from business as usual, a respite from the foggy shades of gray that have surrounded other political events for decades. Of course, it's also time to recall Brecht's often quoted and often misunderstood line, unhappy the land that needs heroes. I wrote, by the time these words are spoken, but it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> by the time these words are published, Kiev may be pulverized and Zelensky murdered, and the fears of nuclear war increasing with proximity to the firing lines can leave no room for celebration. Still, it's worth asking whether this moment suggests that contrary to what historiographers and historians have taught us recently, individuals do play crucial roles in history. 
Historians hate counterfactuals, but I'm a philosopher, and so I'm free to indulge in them and to wonder what would have happened to American Reconstruction had Lincoln not been assassinated, to Chile without the death of Allende, to Russia without the putsch that ousted Gorbachev and installed Yeltsin, whose drunken failures paved the way for Putin, to the Middle East peace process without the assassination of Rabin, there and elsewhere, we can only speculate, but it seems safe to say that had Zelensky accepted America's offer to take him to safety, Ukraine would have fallen in days. For all we may be thrilled by the sight of a man in a moment of moral clarity, some will ask if the rekindled enthusiasm for heroes is a blessing. The claim that heroes are not the motors of history was not the only reason for rejecting them. There are plenty of moral arguments to make us uneasy about the appeal to heroism. To begin with, classical heroes were soldiers. Though Homer's Iliad may leave you convinced about the senselessness of war, it never stopped men from following Achilles' example. Men usually look to be heroes in battle. Women's fronts were no less emphatic for being more diverse bringing food to the needy, letters to the ignorant, balm to the wounded, were attended with all the rhetoric of combat. To be sure, even the 19th century raised doubts about heroism on the battlefield. Tolstoy's war and peace goes a long way towards undermining heroic paradigms, even in defense of a homeland against an outside aggressor. Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was written to satirize the valorization of knighthood. He held veneration of Sir Walter Scott to be a cause of the carnage of the American Civil War. But since the First World War wasn't confined to Russia or America, its impact was broader. Mass death in the trenches undercut classical conceptions of bravery in the field. It was hard to put a heroic spin on the business of cowering in a cold, stinking mud hole watching shells fly, and those who survived it were not inclined to try. Whatever virtues may have been on display in hand-to-hand -hand combat became successively invisible as war turned to trenches and bomber jets. Drones, of course, hadn't been invented. Both the First World War's wide reach and its new weapons played a part in creating suspicion of the heroic, but even more important was the creeping sense that the slaughter had been for naught. World War II presented different problems. Not only the fear that heroic battles might have been fought for nothing, but fought for something worse. It was Mussolini who wrote that the culture of the hero was fascism's answer to bourgeois egotism. Fascism set its sights against the ambiguities of the modern, commissioning art meant to glorify the human spirit. Neither the art nor the spirit came anything close to glorious, with the consequence that the word glory has fallen out of use. For my German colleagues who were raised with photos of fallen Wehrmacht soldiers in the hallway, even the word hero is taboo. The idea of heroism was not just degraded but contaminated. <clears throat> In hindsight, it's easy to share my colleagues' aversion, but it's worth remembering why some yearned for heroism even after World War I. Rumbling bellies surely swelled the ranks of fascist movements in the last century, but just as important was disgust with the pedestrian values the mainstream offered. For those like the German writer Ernst Junger, the warrior was one of the genuine, true, and unrelating enemies of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, for Junger and many others, was materialistic, fixed on possessions, Philistine, and sentimental. Too many parallels have been drawn between fascist and Islamicist totalitarianism, but they certainly have one thing in common. Both attract followers who are sick of the consumerist plodding and passive whining that mark the default positions of the cultures surrounding them. Weary of a world with no room for heroic action, some boys think striking terror will keep them, at least, from becoming the victims they despise. Study after study has shown that most who volunteer for suicide bombing are not wretched bumpkins, but the best and brightest their societies have on offer. 
They and their more passive counterparts, those who no longer aspire to anything more than occasional new gadget, need alternatives whose very cadences show the hero's secret that any life could be large enough to contain a world. The appearance of suicide bombing at the beginning of the century led many to repeat the statement, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. The slogan suggests that heroism is in the eye of the beholder. Even more than beauty, it's beyond the reach of reason. This is the biggest problem heroes present. How can we tell who they are? Yesterday's heroes have been knocked off today's pedestals, some of them none too soon. We've learned about the means by which heroes are created and about what was suppressed in order to valorize them. <clears throat> when I was in school <clears throat> in Atlanta, Georgia, the celebration of Christopher Columbus as the brave adventurer who discovered the new world was so unquestioned that I still remember a children's song naming his ships. We never learned he was not the first to suspect the earth was round, nor that he died believing he'd found not the new world, but the East Indies. More importantly, we never learned that the celebrated voyages of discovery were less driven by the desire for bold adventure and knowledge than by a search for plunder which cost millions of indigenous lives. Nor was Columbus himself, who never set foot in today's United States, a central figure in American myth-making till the end of the 19th century. Italian immigrants who suffered persecution at the hands of their northern European neighbors lobbied intensely to glorify Columbus in order to stress Italian contributions to American history. The first national Columbus Day was proclaimed as an act of atonement for the lynching of 11 Italians in New Orleans in the hope of restoring diplomatic relations with Italy in the wake of that crime. Now, matters might have rested there, as they did for more than a century, had not recent, recent historians shown that Columbus was not merely part of a movement to colonize, pillage, and enslave indigenous lands and peoples, but a particularly brutal part. After he regularly tortured the people he'd enslaved in today's Dominican Republic, cutting off the hands of those who delivered less gold than he demanded, even his patron, King Ferdinand, was sufficiently appalled to remove Columbus from his post as governor. Rising awareness of all that went into and was kept out of the valorization of Columbus had, has now led many Americans to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day in place of Columbus Day. Sometimes history does make progress, though in this case not without protest, both from Italian, American organizations, and Fox News. You can find their reasons for continuing to revere him as a hero all over the internet. Faced with cases like these, and even worse ones, many have urged that we drop the word hero altogether and replace it with the antiseptic word role model. Hitler and Stalin were heroes to some, I've been told, indeed. Once you raise the question of heroism, you must think about fake heroes and failed heroes and a host of things in between. The term role model was invented in 1957 as part of an attempt to avoid the dangers of heroic rhetoric. Yet that rhetoric is dangerous for a reason. It's morally resonant language that's one of the strongest conceptual weapons we possess. The prospect of becoming a role model rarely inspired anyone, while the call to become a hero is a call to action. Like the claim, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, the reflection that Hitler and Stalin were heroes should be the place to start thinking about heroism, not the place to stop. These lectures will explore questions about what it means to be a hero. Must a hero make sacrifices, and how many? How much failure can a hero bear? Heroes need not be flawless, but how many flaws can we accept? What moves people to heroism, and how much does motivation matter? Earlier ages were not naive. Even as they blazed with talk of great men and women, they knew the best heroes were flawed. Charles Dickens never leaves us in doubt about the morals of his stories, 
but his characters are rarely cartoons. You might prefer your daughter to marry Charles Darnay, but he pales next to Sidney Carton, whose walk to the guillotine is a truly a far, far better thing than he ever did before, since he passed most of his life as an interesting drunk. The more memorable the hero, the bigger the cracks. Even courage, the hero's signature, is rarely straightforward. Moby Dick took no fearless whalers on board because, Melville wrote, anyone who's never afraid is not a hero but a fool. Knowing heroes were imperfect and sometimes even silly didn't stop earlier ages from maintaining them anyway. The 20th century, however, introduced something new. Others may have rested with unmasking purported heroes. Our age had something to put in its place. Let me ask you to pause and wonder about a change so pervasive and sweeping, we've come to take it for granted. For thousands of years, heroes were the subject of history. Founding narratives were constructed around them. People and nations competed for the recognition of heroic stature. We may abhor the forms of competition, despise the acts they valorized. Yet however brutal and bloody the kinds of contests they waged, the structure was always clear. Throughout millennia, people struggled for recognition of what they'd done in the world. Today, they struggle for recognition of what the world has done to them. Now, the impulse to shift our focus to the victims of history began as an act of justice. History had been the story of the victors, while the victims' voices went unheard. This condemned the victims to a double death, once in the flesh, once again in memory. To turn the tables and insist that the victims' stories enter the narrative was just part of righting old wrongs. If victim stories have claims on our attention, they have claims on our sympathies and systems of justice. When slaves began to write their memoirs, they took steps towards subjectivity and won recognition, and slowly but surely, recognition's rewards. So the movement to recognize the victims of slaughter and slavery began with the best of intentions. It was part of a process of acknowledging that might and right often fail to coincide, that very bad things happen to all sorts of people, and that even when we cannot change that, we're bound to record it. As an alternative to preceding millennia, when the survivor of a massacre by Mongol invaders or Roman legions could expect no more than a lapidary shit happens, this was a step towards progress. If something went wrong when we wrote, rewrote the place of the victim, the impulse that began in generosity turned downright perverse. The limiting case of this trend is the story of Benjamin Wilkomerski, a Swiss man whose claims to have spent his childhood in a concentration camp turned out to be invented after his book had become a major world bestseller. Earlier rogues sought to hide troubled origins, inventing aristocratic genealogies as a way to rise. Anyone, after all, might be the son of an errant knight or a wayward pope. Now that cachet has given way to another. Claiming a more miserable birth than your true one guarantees new forms of status. Vilkomirsky was not alone. To escape racist discrimination, light-skinned African Americans once passed as white, understandably enough, leaving families and homes behind to live freer lives in the dominant class. Recently, however, several white Americans have lost jobs they gained by falsely passing as black. This year, an African-American actor was jailed for staging a racist attack on himself, and a Jewish-German pop star tried to provoke outrage and attention by inventing an anti-Semitic incident in Leipzig, which hundreds of hours of police investigations could not confirm. Orchestrated victimhood is perfidious because it mocks the victims of real racist attacks, which do occur daily. But I'm less interested now in the consequences and in the fact that it's possible at all. What was recently a stigma has become a source of standing. 
where painful origins and persecution were once acknowledged, as in Frederick Douglass's narratives, the pain was only a prelude to the overcoming of it. Prevailing over victimhood, as Douglass did, could be a source of pride. Victimhood itself was not. The rash of contemporaries inventing worse histories than they actually experienced is something new. Now, I'm not the first to notice what's been dubbed the victimhood Olympics, but I've been struck by how international the phenomenon has become. Take the growth of the academic discipline called memory studies, almost exclusively devoted to the study of bad memories. The injunction to remember was once a call to remember heroic deeds and ideals. Now, never forget is a demand to recall suffering. Although the Holocaust became the paradigm of the contemporary tendency to turn our view from the heroes of history to its victims, the process did not begin in Israel. On the contrary, until the middle of the 1960s, every reference to the victims of the Holocaust was an occasion for shame. Israel was founded to provide an alternative to the image of the Jew as defenseless victim. And the early state was so committed to rejecting that image that it sometimes neglected to care for the victims themselves. Today, Israeli youths often take the laconically named Roots trip the state sponsors to send them to Auschwitz. But in the state's first decades, the Holocaust wasn't even on the lesson plan. Israel took in refugees who staggered out of the concentration camps, but it had trouble embracing them, for they were a threat to the ideals that drove the founding of the country from the start. Its stated goal was normalization, to have opportunities for political self-determination other nations take for granted, to be a land and a people like any other, as the joke went, a place where Jews could be policemen and prostitutes. But what fired pioneers to drain swamps and fight malaria was not a vision of normalcy, but a vision of Jewish heroism. The Jew is no longer to be the passive subject, but the active object of history. Sorry, passive object, <laughs> but the active subject of history. So much for proofreading. Thus, Jewish focus on the Holocaust in Israel and elsewhere began relatively late. It's almost impossible to find before the 1970s. But it became the non plus ultra of identity as victim in an age of identity politics with increasing competition among peoples to prove they were just as miserable victims as anyone else. A book on the Nanking Massacre was subtitled The Forgotten Holocaust of World War II, and its Chinese-American author expressed the wish that her Holocaust would find its Spielberg. Toni Morrison dedicated her great novel, Beloved, to the 60 million and more. As victimhood became an incontestable, you can make up your own examples, I don't want to even go into this one. As victimhood became an incontestable source of recognition, right-wing politicians like Benjamin Netanyahu strove to put the Holocaust in the forefront of Israeli identity directly counter to the ethos with which the nation was founded less than a lifetime before. It was a stance many nations were glad to accept either because, like Germany, they were responsible for the Holocaust, or like the US and Britain, they'd done too little to prevent it. The identification of Israel with the Holocaust came to seem so natural that Germany's largest publisher could present the original architect's grand plan, ground plans for Auschwitz, signed by Heinrich Himmler, to Netanyahu during the prime minister's first state visit to Berlin. The 29 drawings, said the publisher, in a carefully or orchestrated ceremony, were, quote, <clears throat> a gift to the Jewish people as a sign of respect. 50 years earlier, it would have been a slap in the face. Can we imagine the son of Pontius Pilate offering a piece of the true cross to Paul? If the Holocaust became the gold standard for victimhood, Israel is hardly the only nation to instrumentalize it. 
Years ago, I attended a conference where a Ukrainian foreign minister, not the current one, declared, quote, we Ukrainians understand the Jews very well because of our own suffering in the last century. In just one of the unnecessary famines of the 1930s, Ukraine lost seven million of its citizens, end quote. Seven million to six million, and that in one year? The figure's been disputed, but even were the claim of seven million accurate, what was he suggesting? That the Jews ought to throw in the towel in the face of the score and recognize that Ukraine had won? Well, won what? Hegel's phenomenology described a struggle for recognition which he put at the beginning of history. It's a struggle in which the enemy is first overcome through battle and then through production. Now that struggle has been replaced. Recognition is no longer provided by doing more than another, but by enduring more than another. It's a reversal that's fatal for any concept of political morality, for it depends on the assumption that what counts is not what you do in the world, but what the world does to you. Current political debates in Europe over whether communist and fascist oppression were similar are driven by many agendas. Some are attempts to use anti-communism in furthering neoliberal economic policy. Others, especially in the Baltics, have been used to cover up widespread wartime complicity with Nazi crimes. Sometimes they arise from the simple <clears throat> desire to acknowledge wounds that were ignored. Their form, however, always depends on the claim, my pain is worse than your pain. Post-Soviet states writes the historian Tatiana Tsochenko, have built national identities on the notion of collective victimhood in the last two decades. The dominant Soviet narrative of heroic sacrifice and courage during World War II shifted towards multiple narratives of suffering. Until very recently, Russia avoided this shift. This is a monument to the Red Army in Berlin building its post-Cold War identity around the truly heroic role the Soviet Union played in defeating fascism. Few English speakers remember that World War II was not won at Normandy, but at Stalingrad, nor that the Soviet Union lost 27 million people, military and civilian, fighting the Nazis. For Russians, the victory of the Red Army has justly been a source of pride. Putin's recent propaganda with its absurd talk of denazifying Ukraine plays on that pride. It's all the more surprising that though Putin insisted until recently that the West recognize Russia's immense contribution to its wartime defense, he now cultivates an insult which, sorry, he now cultivates an account which emphasizes Russia's suffering at the hands of the West. The man has a good eye for cultural trends. <clears throat> From the Vilkomirsky case, it's not far to a justice that promises to each his own concentration camp. To be less caustic or more precise, undergoing suffering isn't a virtue at all, and it rarely creates any. Victimhood should be a source of legitimation for claims to restitution, but not for anything else. Once we begin to view victimhood per se as the currency of recognition, we're on the road to divorcing recognition and legitimacy from virtue altogether. Let me be clear, my view is not the view of Nietzsche, who was first to notice this development, which he located in Christianity. In an act of insidious revenge, he wrote, Christians turned aristocratic values of strength and supremacy into vices and elevated the meek who could not have beaten their masters in a fair fight. Note, however, it was centuries before the image of the man of sorrows replaced the image of Christ triumphant. But the German reference, uh, the Christian reference has its limits. Jesus was not a victim, but a martyr who chose his own fate and inspired saints to do so. No one volunteered for a place on the Middle Passage or the train to Treblinka, which is why the barbed wire halo that has come to surround the concentration clamps is misplaced. Nor am I calling, as Nietzsche sometimes did, for a return to old Greek virtues, 
where the strong trampled on the weak without guilt or shame and called it natural. It's a sign of moral progress that we no longer dismiss victim stories. They deserve our empathy and, wherever possible, reparations. My question is rather what we mean when we call for recognition. Jean-Marie did not even want to erect a monument to the victims of the Third Reich because, as he wrote, to be a victim <clears throat> is not an honor. That claim sprang from an assumption that now seems outdated. Monuments should be reserved for those whose deeds we admire, whose paths we want to follow. Amory is one of my heroes, so I won't be talking about him at length, but his work is translated, and I cannot recommend it enough. Born as Hans Meyer, an assimilated Jew, in 1906, he was too poor to attend university, but became one of the more erudite writers of his day. Amory fled Vienna for Belgium after the Anschluss, joined a resistance group in Brussels, where he was arrested and tortured by the Gestapo, who sent him to Auschwitz on discovering he was a Jew. His short book, At the Mind's Limits, remains the most searing confrontation with the Holocaust I ever wrote, read. There he writes, and I quote, we did not become wiser in Auschwitz if by wisdom one understands positive knowledge of the world. We perceive nothing there that we would not already have been able to perceive on the outside. <clears throat> not a bit of it brought practical guidance. In the camp, too, we did not become deeper. If that calamitous death, depth is at all a definable intellectual quality, it goes without saying, I believe, that in Auschwitz we did not become better, more human, more humane, and more mature ethically. You do not observe dehumanized man committing his deeds and misdeeds without having all your notions of inherent human dignity placed in doubt. We emerge from the camp stripped, robbed, emptied out, disoriented, and it was a long time before we were able even to learn the or ordinary language of freedom. End quote. Amory's unbending on honesty is only one mark of his lifelong courage. It's a piece of bitter irony that his most courageous writings, brilliant defenses of the Enlightenment, in full defense, in full understanding of its failures, are less well known than those writings that examine his experience as a victim of torture and terror. I propose we return to a model in which your claims to legitimacy are focused on what you've done to the world, not what the world did to you. This wouldn't return the victims to the ash heap of history, but it would bring the heroes back to center stage. One heroic virtue is generosity, as well as the humility that recognizes the role contingency plays in our lives. There but for fortune could any of us go. This should allow us to honor caring for victims as a virtue without suggesting that being a victim is one as well. Heroes make plain that some men and women have actually lived according to the ideals we claim to cherish and thereby reveal alternatives to resignation. They show that the limits of life can be probed and extended, that we need not swallow every piece of the framework in which we were born. Except human nature, we do not know what our nature permits us to be, wrote Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Even if you believe him, knowledge is not the same as conviction. You may sense that the limits of your tribe or your town are not the limits of what's possible. But until you witness someone actually overcome them, you're unlikely to believe that it's possible for you. I've been mildly obsessed with the nature of heroism for quite some time, and though I've written about it here and there, I'm deeply grateful for the invitation to give the Gifford Lectures, which gave me a chance to work out my obsession at some length. I will not, however, give necessary and sufficient conditions for being a hero, nor provide a formula for deciding whether someone is a hero rather than a daredevil, a celebrity, or a terrorist.
I don't believe we can give necessary and sufficient conditions for any contested concept. And contested concepts are always the interesting ones. Think of justice or evil. He has mis a, a mistake to think if we can't get a formula that determines a concept, we cannot make reasonable judgments about it. I'm indebted to Lorraine Daston's brilliant study of rules for showing that even early modern rule books for arithmetic were not purely algorithmic. They rather depended on thick rules balanced between universal and particular by showing how agility and judgment are needed to, to decide all but the simplest cases, even in mathematics, that most rule-bound of disciplines. Still, the difficulty of defining a hero can leave us doubting if it's a useful concept at all. In practice, our heroes are usually too big or too small. Either we want them to have all the virtues, only to turn in disappointment and declare they have none, or we use the term so loosely that anyone who excels at kicking a ball or playing a guitar is deemed a hero. When advertisements for Viagra promise to turn any consumer into a hero of love, or vodka, uh, this is a German word for hero is held, you may suspect that the concept is too debased to be useful. One impulse that undercut heroic paradigms is the late 20th century's taste for deconstruction. But the proverb, no man is a hero to his valet, was already proverbial in the 17th century. Anyone who takes boots off a general will find feet of clay if he seeks them. In a world where we take our own pants off or wait to have them removed by a tabloid, we can all be valets and the feet are up out in the open. Sometimes it's not the murderous but the puerile impulses in all of us which can make the search for something heroic seem ridiculous. Yet this problem was already confronted by Hegel, who countered, no man is a hero to his valet, not, however, because the man is not a hero, but because the valet is a valet. The valet's view of the world is crude and common, and he will turn up every stone to confirm it. After modeling a hero with proportions too flat to fit anything but a comic book, he asserts there are no more heroes in the world. His picture is as one-dimensional as it is cheap, for he can't imagine any other. Petty and ungenerous people project pettiness and parsimony onto others. Magnanimous souls expect to resonate with others. It takes one, in short, to know one. If you aspire to be a hero, you know that your feet can ache and stink and still climb whatever peaks need to be scaled until you stand there holding the fort. If you're a valet, you'll see nothing but mud. The impulse to expect perfection from our heroes is a search for saints instead, one way of creating a world in which there are almost no heroes at all. No wonder it seems easier to focus on victims. Initially, at least, they're easier to identify, as long as you have half a heart. Yet since the victim paradigm has become so appealing that it's co-opted by the likes of Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, we must see it's no place to seek epistemological refuge. So instead of giving you <clears throat> definitions in these lectures, I will give you exemplars. My second lecture on Odysseus will examine the first clear case of a contested hero. That's one reason to call him the first modern hero, for whether he deserved the accolade was hotly debated in ancient Greece. At the time, only a few could be heroes. The Greek word hero meant something like the English lord, with similar ambivalence about the relation to the divine. The requisite traits were established by lineage. One reason Homer's heroes are always repeating the names of their parents. A minor provincial prince, Odysseus barely qualified. Greek hero worship was literal. Shrines were built to them where sick people prayed in hope of a cure. The word was also virtually synonymous with warrior. Like any lord of his day, Odysseus fought battles, but not, that's not why he was remembered, one of the reasons why poets like Pindar bemoaned his valorization. Unlike Achilles and others whose fate was determined at birth, Odysseus makes choices 
very often the wrong ones. Interesting heroes are flawed. In the final four lectures, I'll present case studies of contested heroes I particularly admire. They all have something to offer us, though the last of them, Paul Robeson, died nearly half a century ago. None of them was a saint, and only one could be called a martyr. If heroes, as I argue, are meant to inspire, they must be men and women of flesh and blood, liable to failings and fears. Nothing about my four heroes is exclusive. I could have chosen others, and presumably so could you. The point of portraying these four heroes in detail is not to start a new canon, though I wouldn't be sorry if some of my heroes became yours too. More important is to show the kind of thinking we need to practice when we seek an answer to the question, was she a hero? It's a question Kant thought so compelling that, as he put it, quote, even businessmen, women, and 10-year-old children, end quote, regularly discuss it just for fun. To decide it, as you'll know from disputes after watching a particularly engaging television series, it's not enough to focus on one brave or noble act. It requires an understanding of contexts and motives and character, watching for faults and excuses and weighing them all. You needn't be the lawyer for your heroes, said a friend who was kind enough to comment helpfully on drafts of uh, two of these lectures. In fact, I do. Hero is a term of praise, the very highest we have on offer. Given the urge to either inflate or deconstruct it, I need to give arguments to show why these men and women have a right to the term, not only to honor them, but to show this kind of reasoning to be possible. As I'll try to show, heroes come in holes, so that nothing less than a whole life will suffice to make that judgment. One reason the four people I chose happen to be world historical figures is that the amount of information about all of them makes it easier to answer the question, was she a hero or a fraud or a star? While the lives and works of those heroes I've chosen have been sufficiently studied, so little about them remains hidden. I don't mean to suggest that only those blessed with the talents of George Eliot or Paul Robeson may count as heroes. Unsung heroes are found in most traditions, whether as nameless fallen soldiers or doctors and nurses who risk their lives to save others in pandemics or war zones. One quality common to all my heroes is a deep respect for those whose names, unlike their own, were never recorded in bright lights. That such heroes exist and inspire us is unquestionable, undercutting the claim that heroes are elitist, or at least undemocratic, since rants against democracy and demands for heroic figures often come together, as they did say in Carlisle, some say democratic, heroes cannot grow in democratic soil, which is devoted to producing fruits of the same height. Yet heroism can appear anywhere and any time. As courage requires neither wealth nor learning, it is far more democratic than other forms of human excellence. It doesn't matter where a hero comes from. Obscure origins can be a bonus, but only what she does. What makes people aspire to be heroes? Pure instrumental reason can't account for it, though some evolutionary psychologists have tried. For heroism <clears throat> is unaccountable from the point of view of, quote, the biological perspective which assumes organisms should act only to improve their own fitness to reproduce. One could rec reconsider the biological perspective itself if the result is to render such men and women irrational. Instead, most evolutionary psychologists try to resolve this as they solve what they call the problem of altruism by arguing that it can benefit one organism to help another if the organism to be helped is biologically related or likely to reciprocate the help at a later date. But heroism ups the anti, ups the ante, since it involves more risk than ordinary uh, altruism. I'm quoting from um, an evolutionary biologist. She wrote, quote, 
Dying is clear evidence that you have sacrificed your genetic fitness. And unless you've saved approximately two of your biological children, plus at least a niece or a nephew from dying in the act, because each child shares half of your genes, plus you share a quarter of your genes with your siblings' children, you will not recoup your benefits to your genes in the next generation, end quote. Uh, this does sound like parody, though the author doesn't seem to realize it. This was done with a straight face. She concludes that heroism is mysterious from an evolutionary perspective and calls for more research since, quote, there are almost no coherent psychological, evolutionary, or neuroscientific accounts of heroism that predict when people will respond and who is most likely to act. Nor can there be. That's the thing about freedom. It can't be predicted because it isn't determined. In her observations about how individual Germans behaved during the Nazi period, written when she returned to the country in 1949, Hannah Arendt wrote that neither class nor education nor political leanings nor anything else she knew about people beforehand foretold how they would act under tyranny. She said it was the surprise of her life. Nevertheless, some continue to seek evolutionary explanations. If heroism doesn't directly benefit your relatives, perhaps it increases your status. For men, in particular, bravery may be sexy, resulting in increased reproductive opportunities. I'm going to save you some more comic, <clears throat> as I find them, evolutionary psychology. A good friend of mine calls them ev very distinguished philosopher of science, calls them ev psychos. <clears throat> For those who give their lives, such status rewards will be irrelevant. But evolutionary psychology is often less science than ideology. In this case, ideology blinds us to the ordinary experience we have when we admire a hero. We do so precisely because heroes reveal the possibility of standing above the costs and calculations that crisscross ordinary days. They show that human lives could be something other than a series of perpetual risk-benefit analyses. That's the reason that millions of people across the world who knew nothing about Ukrainians have been fascinated by their refusal to surrender to tyranny. Their dignity can't be quantified. Evolutionary psychology's attempts to explain heroism by reducing it to instrumental kinds of reckoning unwittingly reveal the opposite. We revere heroes because they act in ways that cannot be understood in those terms. Like his critique of pure reason, <clears throat> Kant's critique of practical reason has a transcendental deduction. Most readers begin it in the hope they're about to get a proof of the moral law. I have the aspiration of writing a book that doesn't even mention Kant, and I'm not sure that I ever will. Although I've written about lots of different things, but Kant does turn up, and I'm sure you'll see why in a moment. Most readers begin the transcendental deduction in the Critique of Practical Reason in the hope they're about to get a proof of the moral law akin to the demonstration that experience would be impossible without the order provided by the categories. A little reflection shows such hope to be futile. We may not be able to conceive a world without causality, but experience has been steadily revealing the absence of moral order since the book of Job at the very latest. A proof of the moral law would be the real philosopher's stone, the sort of thing you'd love to whip out to silence an apologist for torture, or at least the tireless speaker who haunts lectures on ethics demanding a knockdown argument against moral relativism. Just at the point in the critique of practical reason where Kant's readers hope for a proof, he offers a thought experiment. Imagine a fellow who insists he can't resist temptation every time he passes the local brothel. Kant called it a certain house, but this was the 18th century. It's clear what he was talking about. Were you to threaten him with execution as soon as he left it, 
installing a gallows on the doorstep to keep his thoughts focused, he'd be sure to discover his temptation to be quite resistible, thank you. The fear of death trumps every ordinary human desire, since staying alive is a necessary condition on fulfilling any of them. Now imagine the same man ordered by an unjust tyrant to sign a letter that will condemn an innocent man to death. Like most of us, he would likely find ways to quiet his conscience, defer to his family, forge reasons of state, and choose his own life over another's. But for a moment at least he will waver, and the wavering counts. In the first case, we know exactly what we'd do, give up sex or gold or chocolate or any other form of pleasure in order to stay alive, and we know this as we know any other truth of nature. In the second case, we do not. And in the moment of uncertainty about what we would do, we know what we should do, and thus what we could. That moment is the one in which we grasp our own freedom. Justice can move us to deeds <clears throat> that overcome the strongest of natural desires, the love of life itself. That reveals a measure of human dignity which nothing else can, and lifts us out of a world in which our lives are determined into one that is genuinely transcendent. If Kant's terms are metaphysical, the experiment he describes is achingly ordinary. Acts of heroism defy the constraints that keep us on our everyday paths, the prudence that guards possessions and prospects, the love we bear for those nearest to us, the fears of loneliness, pain, and death. Those constraints weigh so heavily on us that we often imagine, that, imagine them to be as inviolable as natural law. The hero, of course, is not the only one who may violate social constraints. Madmen and certain kinds of performance artists do so too. We admire heroes because they defy those constraints for the sake of principle and briefly bring the natural and mor moral orders into harmony. It's a thought experiment any of us can perform and it explains the impulse that otherwise seems irrational. If the drive for self-preservation is elemental, whatever could induce people to give up the one solid base of everything they might desire or hope in the name of an untouchable abstraction? Kant suggests the impulse can't be dismissed as romantic or mystical, still less as a nihilistic wish for destructive abandon. Those who disdain simple survival to risk their own lives don't seek death as such, but the force that makes life worthwhile. We cannot offer them alternatives unless we acknowledge what's at stake. Kant says it's the manifest experience of freedom. That's the experience that leads men to risk their lives in war and those who survive to describe their wartime experiences as the times they felt most alive. For many military heroes, the risk alone gives sense to the act. The most ancient Greek heroes died for glory alone, rewarding risk itself without seeking further meaning. Modern heroes take risks for principles larger than their own immortal fame. They need not forfeit their lives. Only one of the heroes I'll portray actually did so. But they must be prepared to scorn safety and risk something significant their livelihoods or their place in a community not ready to follow them for the sake of something they value even more. The risk need not be mortal. It's crucial to remember examples of heroism that don't end in martyrdom. But risk must be more than something you take on the stock market. Yet heroes move us not only because of what they do, but because of what they are. It isn't enough that they set a particular causal chain in motion. There must be something about them which is admirable. Social scientists have used surveys to create, create list, lists of heroic traits. But apart from the difficulty of understanding how any of those virtues are determined in real context, because they're always very general, such lists leave out the quality every hero must have, but no one knows how to describe. Earlier times may not have understood it any better than we do, but they weren't as embarrassed to name it. The life force, or spark, thought close to the divine. It is not. 
Instead, it's something that makes those who have it fully human, and those who don't look like sleepwalkers. Max Weber called it charisma, a word that comes from the Greek divine gift. The German sociologist did try to define it further, citing special gifts of oratory and leadership. But while this may secularize the concept, it hardly analyzes it. Those with charisma are often called larger than life. I'll take this as a cue for understanding a bit more about the quality. I prefer to name presence, knowing full well that shifting terms by itself does no more to define this crucial feature. We recognize when we see it, but cannot explain. Larger than life? Surely larger than the lives most of us live most of the time. <clears throat> Heroes remind us that life itself is larger than the dimensions we are urged to accept. The injunction, be realistic, is so often a way of saying, decrease your expectations. Heroes refuse to take the given as given. Our lives and our possibilities are limited, but we do not know those limits. For heroes, life is a matter of testing them. I understand the admiration for those who excel in sport or even music, though I do not call them heroes. We thereby honor the steely resolve it takes to stretch normal limits on what human bodies can do. If heroes do nothing but throw all their weight against the purveyors of resignation, as deadly and seductive as any siren, they do a great deal. At once, challenge, threat, and offering. They are balance against all the voices that whisper, life sucks and then you die. Anyone whose life relays the message that we need not succumb has the capacity to become heroic. When Carlyle wrote to a hero, it is ever clear that this world is wholly miraculous, he got something right. Attempts to describe this quality risks sounding like Nietzsche at best and Ayn Rand at worst. Only the arts can do it justice. When philosophers try to evoke it, we speak in platitudes. The quality I want to describe may be best evoked in Tennyson's Ulysses. Many of you know the poem. I want to remind you of a few lines that are crucial for me here. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield." End quote. Odysseus is such a person, which is why he belongs in my pantheon, even if many of his actions would disqualify him today. Beset by force after force that would bring most men down, what moves us is not his survival, but his capacity to be alive in the very fullest sense against the silent awareness that few of us are. It isn't enough to make someone heroic, but without it, any hero will be forgotten. Rousseau called it force of soul. Arendt called it love of the world. Earlier ages called it vital force. It's the foundation of eros. You can call it charisma, as long as you admit it's just a word that marks what we don't understand. Is it a gift of the gods or something that has to be earned? Watching such people, you will sense that it's both given like perfect pitch or grace that no one can deserve or strive for, and captured like the greatest surprises it is. If presence is granted to some and not others, must we conclude that heroes are elitist after all? Kant's thought exper experiment suggests that anyone, however unlikely, can feel the urge to ignore the material constraints that normally determine our lives, to taste that freedom which transcends them, even if most of us never will. But there's another answer to the worry about elitism. Consider babies. Nearly every baby approaches nearly every bit of our surroundings with the intense vivacity that the most talented turn into art someday. 
It's a new world, after all, to be explored with the bold high spirits that put Columbus in the shade. Earlier ages might have called the babies awe and wonder religious. I believe it's the reason they exert such fascination on adults, at least when we're not constantly responsible for taking care of them. Something in the way our world is structured destroys the ability to experience life that children express in their first two years of it. Like Carlyle's heroes, they approach the world as a miracle, and that often makes them seem more wholly alive than the adults around them. Heroes not only remind us of what we could become if we're determined, but also of what most of us have been before the force of disappointment led us to settle for less. <clears throat> Living life in recognition that it is a gift after all, is a form of gratitude for the fact that it's been bestowed upon us. The more we can do this, the more meaning we will win. All the more so if our lives can contribute to opposing those forces that deaden the light in children's eyes. Heroes reveal the difference between theoretical possibilities and real ones, proving beyond doubt that isn't merely wishful thinking that makes you want to be more alive. In showing us alternatives to resignation, they pose a challenge. But every challenge is also a threat. And the knowledge that some people have made more out of their lives than you have is not always welcome. The vision of those who did so may be so unnerving that you'd rather see them dead. Not consciously, of course. But it's remarkable how many people, when asked to name heroes, name martyrs instead. Anything you have to die for is supererogatory. Knowing that those who lived more than you have and lived to tell the tale can create resentment. <clears throat> this is especially true when the hero in question is a moral one. You may never have a moment when you want to climb Everest. I certainly don't. But you'd like to think you could defy a tyrant if you had to. And since none of us know what we would do in most extreme cases, the vision of those who risked their lives for the sake of ideals can serve as a threat. Why think the only real hero is a dead hero? For a start, there are trivial reasons, like piety. The young Rousseau went so far as to say we'd remember Socrates only as a skillful sophist if he'd only died in bed. Dead heroes' flaws can be forgotten like dead criminal, criminal sentences. There's little point in insisting on either. But the more important reason we view death as central to heroism is less attractive. A part of us wants to resign. The greater the number of people who have done so before us, the lesser the strain on our conscience. And the higher the price of resistance, the more understandable resignation will be. If you have to choose death to combat injustice, most people will forgive you for staying home. It's no accident that the two cases of resistance to the Nazis that are most celebrated in Germany, the Scholl siblings and the 1944 conspirators, were martyred and their deeds accomplished absolutely nothing. Their resistance is honored, but their stories are told in Germany as a salve to the conscience of those who never even tried. If heroes can evoke resentment, they more often inspire, and the war in Ukraine has revealed a longing for the kind of inspiration only heroes can provide. My choice to demand, my choice to portray heroes who are dead is a matter of caution. You don't demand that your hero be flawless, but were she to renounce everything she stood for on her deathbed, you'd have trouble maintaining your esteem. With the exception of John Brown, none of those I'll portray sacrificed their lives for their conditions, for their convictions. None of them had easy lives. All of them had good ones. Saints have primarily to suffer. Heroes do not. And when I get weary and sick of trying, it's their example that keeps me steady. If he could stand that, surely I can find the strength to do less. Perhaps that's the biggest difference between victims and heroes. Imitating the former is never a goal. We do not understand how heroes spark the desire to follow their examples, but we understand what Plutarch wrote in explaining why he wrote his lives, 
I'm going to quote Plutarch. To end here, virtue by the bare statement of his actions can so affect men's minds as to create at once both adm admiration of the thing done and desire to imitate the doers of them. Moral good is a practical stimulus. It is no sooner seen that it inspires an impulse to practice and influences the mind and character not by a mere imitation which we look at, but by the statement of the fact creates a moral purpose which we form. That's from the life of Pericles. I've been asked if this is philosophy, as I've been asked for other subjects I pursue. One answer I give is that 20th century philosophy abandoned an array of questions that occupied philosophers for millennia in order to focus on tedious issues of epistemology that, as Kant himself wrote in the Critique of Pure Reason, are but cobwebs of interest to pedants. In this case, I could offer a list of philosophers who gave considerable thought to heroes and their impact on the world. They include Plato, Plutarch, Vico, Rousseau, Kant, Fichte, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Emerson, Nietzsche, William James, Walter Benjamin, and Hannah Arendt. Why 20th century philosophy chose to focus on those questions in their work that could be canonized as core philosophy and left out the interesting ones is a question that's beyond the scope of these lectures. In giving them, however, I hope to open doors to other questions that philosophy left by the way. It would be a mistake, however, to see those questions as ethical rather than metaphysical. They are often the point where both come together. For some time now, I've written about the most revolutionary point of Kant's metaphysics, the insight that the world is permanently torn between the way it is and the way it ought to be. You are not imagining it. The indignation you feel when you witness gross injustice cannot be reduced to anything else. The torment of a child, as Dostoevsky unforgettably argued, is an indictment of a world that contains such an unbridgeable gap. Neither the pain nor the glory will entirely cease. Otherwise, the gap between them couldn't cause the metaphysical wound in the heart of the world, as Nietzsche put it. Heroes are those who can navigate the distance between the is and the ought and occasionally overcome it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, You're very welcome. That was a fascinating lecture. Not only did you throw all sorts of new light on the ideas of hero and victim, but you also opened the door to some fascinating lectures to come. And, and I, I'm really excited, as I'm sure everyone here is, to hear the rest of your lecture series. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. We have a little time for questions. Um, so if I could ask if you have a question, would you put your hand up so that uh, Mark can reach you with our microphone? Um, and then we'll take a few questions. There may be questions from our online audience as well. But uh, first of all, we'll start in the room. So. Yes, please. Thank you. First of all, very hearty congratulations, coupled with our wish that the lecture you have just given could be read by as many people as possible, with the regret that they would not hear the music with which you delivered it so well. I would want to suggest that you yourself, in taking this gigantic subject, have shown yourself a hero. And here, of course, we would have to say a hero comparable to Thomas Carlyle. It is true that I wish that what you have said would be spread as widely as possible to the world. And there is a great deal that Carlyle wrote that I wished he never had. <laughs> yes. But both of you show this terrific heroism in taking on history beyond anything like normal dimensions of space and time. You are giving that heroism that he showed in writing on heroes, heroism, and the heroic in history. Um, 
One point I venture to suggest is this. Your fascinating argument about Columbus should surely also take into account the fact that Columbus was the nearest that the United States of America got to naming itself, <laughs> but never quite succeeded. That as we look at America, we see so many areas where Columbus is honored long, long before any Italians were lynched in New Orleans, and specifically the towns, the cities, even the um, music of Hail Columbia, the university, and so forth. That Columbia, Columbus was there to be canonized and yet never made it. And the United States of America remains perpetually unnamed. But again, above all, to thank you. You are very kind, sir. Um, and I, uh, of course, am uh, honored by your remarks. Uh, this will be a book, so more people will read it. <laughs> and um, I guess it will also be on YouTube for oh, those who aren't yes. here. I, um, every once in a while, I, you know, someone very kindly tells me that I'm brave. And honestly, um, I don't feel that I quite deserve that honor. Um, bravery for me really does involve more risk than I feel that I'm taking in writing on um, topics that are, unfortunately, um, not often considered in 20th and 21st century philosophy. They can be a little difficult uh, in getting tenure, I'll grant you that. <laughs> so it took me a bit. But, um, you know, once someone is able to earn a living and feed their family, I honestly don't understand why more people don't take intellectual risks. Um, but I do hope that um, my work can encourage other people to do more of that. Thank you. Got a question here. Uh, thank you very, very much for your lecture. Um, I myself from Germany but I also lived in Israel for a year, and I found it interesting that you were bringing samples from both countries. And um, I think it's telling that in the German commemoration of the Third Reich, it's um, non-Jewish Germans like uh, the Scholl siblings that are commemorated as the heroic victims and not uh, Jewish victims or um, uh, yeah, um, resistance fighters like the ghetto, Warsaw ghetto fighters that are commemorated in Israel. So I'd be interested if you could say something about the uh, relation between um, heroes or heroism, victimization, and nationalism or national identity. So my last book is called Learning from the Germans. And um, it's a long discussion of the very complicated topic, as you surely know, of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. So it's rather hard for me to say something short about it. Um, <laughs> and um, I, uh, you know, like you, I, I lived for five years in Israel, and I'm a citizen of both countries and of the United States as well. So I have three passports. Um, so I, I do know quite a lot about those two cultures. I mean, the point of valorizing the Scholl siblings and the 1944 conspirators was allegedly to show that there were some Germans who resisted the Nazis. And so valorizing the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto wouldn't have made the same point. I believe, however, and this is really quite, yeah, a disturbing point, as I suggested very quickly. Um, they, you know, every town in Germany has a street named after the Shoah siblings, and, you know, they're, they're much lauded. And, and, um, my view is that they, their actual role 
is to tell people, you know what, it was okay that you didn't do anything because first of all, you would have been executed and secondly, you wouldn't have accomplished anything anyway. My interest is in the resistance heroes, heroines, uh, although we're not doing that anymore in English, although everybody's doing it in German, it's very complicated. Gender discourse is very different in both the languages. Um, <clears throat> You may or may not know about the women of the Rosenstrasse in, you see, you don't even know. <laughs> this is outrageous. <laughs> but not about you, but because many, many people don't, even if they live in Berlin where there is a little monument to them. Um, so in 1943, in the darkest period of the war, uh, the Nazis had not yet rounded up um, Jews who were married to Aryans. They had, you know, all kinds of things done to them, and there was all kinds of pressure on their spouses to divorce them. But they didn't want trouble, and so they, they allowed them to work in difficult conditions and stay with their spouses. So in February 1943, they decided to round up about 400 men, the um, number is disputed historically, who were married to German non-Jewish women. And they rounded them up and they took them to a place uh, on a street called the Rosenstrasse, right in the middle of Be Berlin. If you go to Alexanderplatz, it's right around the corner. And their wives, many of whom didn't know each other, all came and stood there in the freezing Berlin winter and said, we are not leaving until you give us our men back. And they stood there for 10 days and the Gestapo trained machine guns on them and they said, you know what, um, we don't care. Um, <laughs> you can shoot us, but we're not leaving. And they gave them back and all of them survived, and the monument is um, made by the daughter. It's a quite moving sculpture, sculpture, I find, of one of those marriages, okay? Now, why is this story not known? <laughs> this story, as opposed to the Shaws and the, the 1944 people, of course, shows that actually uh, nonviolent resistance could indeed work uh, even against an absolute totalitarian regime, which is why I think the story is not. There is a movie by Margarita von Trotta, if you're interested in see, but it's, you know, again, it's, it's not very well known. Um, I could go on about this for ages, but perhaps we should <laughs> st take another subject. Got one here. Thank you for that lecture. I'm curious, um, so you, you talked about kind of heroes of people that oppose the forces that dull the light in children's eyes. And for me, an obvious one that came to my head was a patriarchy. But all of the people you've chosen are men or someone who, who is unable to be a hero because of their inter alias as writing as a man. So kind of how, how, how do they fit together? What, do you not see any, is, is there no, you know, yeah, you get that. Okay, two answers. Um, one is, yes, there is a feminist objection to the whole concept of heroism, which says it's toxic masculinity and we should do away with the whole concept. Frankly, I think this is ridiculous. First of all, there have been um, heroines, uh, you know, back in antiquity. Think of uh, Antigone as one example, but there are many, many others. And there have even been women warriors, I think, thought actually about including one, uh, Hannah Senesh, who if you've been in Israel, you might know of, a very, very brave 23-year-old poet who parachuted into Hungary um, to try and save other Hungarian Jews, although she herself had gotten safely to Palestine. She was caught and executed. Um, but I actually wanted to get away from military uh, heroes and, and only include one of them. Look, at George Eliot, as you'll find um, when I talk about George Eliot, was as much of a woman as anybody who ever lived. Um, and she was clearly identified as one. And she wrote a great deal about the constraints which prevent women with his 
heroic aspirations from actually living heroic lives. And it's quite interesting because she herself led a very heroic life. The reason why she used a male pseudonym, as many people did, Charlotte Bronte did, um, was first of all, she wanted her books to be read and not dismissed. Secondly, she was in the middle of the scandal of uh, sort of mid-19th century London because she was openly living with a married man. Um, and she wanted her books to be uh, the subject uh, you know, she wanted people to pay attention to the books and not the scandal. Where they did, she got to be extremely famous, but um, it, it's entirely false to say that she only became a hero by pretending to be a man, because there was just no question of, uh, you know, the ways in which she was wo a woman, a very passionate woman, by the way, as well. You know, when I hear this feminist argument, I'm not saying you're making it, but you were asking me about the contradiction. Um, I, you know, I, I often sort of wonder, look, um, you know, people could say they know women philosophers. Well, they're a couple, but really not until the last century. But there's a very easy answer to that question, although I must say, when I was 21, one of my mentors, not one of the famous ones, so I, I'm not... Um, I'm not uh, revealing anything about John Rawls, say, um, who really did treat every, the reason why Rawls had so many women students is that he really treated everybody as if we were all in the original position. He just seemed not to notice the difference between genders. Um, but another mentor of mine, who I'm still grateful um, for what I got to him, said to me when I was 21 years, Susan, I'd like to think that women could do philosophy as well as men. I just never saw saw it, <laughs> kind of thing that nobody would say today anymore, and it's a bit heavy to lay on a 21-year-old. Um, but the truth is, they're perfectly, you know, good historical explanations of why there weren't a lot of women philosophers, as opposed to, say, women writers, where all you really need is a room of your own. And, you know, so in the 19th century uh, produced, and even earlier, but particularly the 19th century, produced a, you know, number of, I, I mean, I happen to think George Eliot is the greatest writer in, in, in English literature. I think the only person who comes close is Tolstoy, but he's Russian. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but all you needed was a room of your own and an eye for observation. To do philosophy, you need training, and women were not allowed to go to university. Um, so, um, you know, I just I feel like that about heroism, and you'll, you'll see when I talk about Eliot, but perhaps, um, perhaps I, I hope I will inspire you to actually go and read some of Eliot, and you'll see her description of women's lives that don't permit heroism. Um, yes, there's one up at the back there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your fantastic lecture. I really learned a lot from it. Um, I, I was just wondering if in, <clears throat> in your account of heroism, there is also room for like context dependent, like understandings of heroism and whether perhaps if we're in different traditions of political thought, if we're in different traditions of political philosophy, there is also room for understanding heroism differently and having like different values of what should be considered heroism um, and whether it can be possible to I am just curious if it, it is possible to think about a kind of cross-cultural understanding of heroism, if that something like that is even possible. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Um, I think heroes are quite universal, and I think they tend to have the same qualities. I don't think there is a particular, um, you know, cultural hold on heroes, though I'll confess right away, most of my knowledge is of the European tradition, and I try and confine um, you know, what I have to say to things that I really know a lot about. But I do read in um, a number of 
non-European traditions, though not in non-European languages, myself. What I decided, and I have been thinking about the subject for over a decade, perhaps even longer, um, I really don't think you can give necessary and sufficient conditions for being heroic. I think you have to look in detail at a whole life. And, um, and so that's why the, the rest of these lectures will take the form of portraying, well, the first life is fictional, but um, four real lives that I've studied pretty intensely. But I need them to be as, you know, examples for studying other lives. I mean, I certainly don't mean them to rule out, you know, to be exhaustive by any means whatsoever. But examples of the kinds of questions we ask of someone when we want to decide was she a hero or not. And, you know, to push against the throwing up your hands, well, one person's hero is another person's freedom fighter, so we can't say anything reasonable about it at all. But I, I don't know of general rules. I'm, honestly, I've tried. I, I've, I've read a lot about the subject. And um, I just don't think any of them work as well as sitting down and studying someone's life and work. I, 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 I realize that may be a frustrating answer, but it's the only one I've got for you. Thank you. We'll just take one last question. So you mentioned presence and charisma as uh, basically kind of gateways to heroism. And I'm wondering why you didn't mention vision. Because when I think about heroes, I think about the vision that they have that someone else doesn't have. So for example, Hamlet. Hamlet. Hamlet, Hamlet envisions a world where there's justice, uh, where you don't need revenge. And he gets all caught up in machinations and of course becomes, you know, a tragedy. Um, and that leads me to my second question. Heroism is always placed in genres. So you've got tragic heroes, you've got epic heroes, etc. And that changes how they circulate in society um, and in history. And I'm wondering if you would kind of speak to that. Thank you. You know, it's funny, I was just reading today, Fintan O'Toole on Hamlet, one of my favorite writers, um, and uh, his discussion of the idea that Hamlet really isn't a tragic hero in the sense that it's traditionally understood. I think he would go more for your view. The reason I didn't leave out, the, the reason I didn't talk about vision is that I wanted to include Odysseus. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you'll see if you come tomorrow, I, I do think he does have a vision, but it's certainly not the kind of moral vision that if you and Finn O'Toole sort of are right, um, Hamlet has, and certainly not the kind of moral vision that the other four people I'm going to talk about did. Um, you think this may not be true of Einstein, but that's because, like the women of the Rosenstrasse, people don't actually know just how heroic Einstein was. Um, they didn't know about his social, moral, and political vision. They just think of him as uh, kind of cute and um, famous. Um, so I agree with you that... Um, you know, in anybody that I would want to take up as inspiring, I don't know if anybody knows who Paul Robeson is, though I hope you'll, uh, does anybody know who Paul Robeson is, was? Anybody? No. Not too many, it's too bad. Well, um, lots of pictures of Paul Robeson in Glasgow yesterday. 
Pictures of him in Glasgow. He spoke at media rally in Glasgow in the 60s. Oh, he, I, I'll give you quite a few quotes of um, Robson in, in, in Britain, but also in Scotland. Um, um, he was in the middle of the 20th century, according to W.B. Du Bois, the most famous man in the, the most famous American in the world, and he was. Um, but his story has been kind of wiped out. So when I, um, you know, when I'm feeling discouraged, it's an interesting word, discouraged, um, feeling like I need some courage, I really do put on um, the music of Paul Robeson, and it keeps me going. So, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, Necessarily, I, I wouldn't think of Ulysses. I would think I would think of Robson, but because I do think this quality of presence is important, and it connects them, and that there are people who we might want to see as questionable heroes. I mean, a lot of people think Hamlet is not a hero, okay? Um, but he clearly has presence. Um, and he clearly, you know, just has moved millions of people for a very long time. Um, so one can find some of the soliloquies that have a moral vision, but it's, it's, it's a reading. It's not a clear reading. So, um, so, I, so I didn't want to... Um, to confine a discussion of heroism only to people who had a clear moral and political vision, um, although those are the people who I would follow today or be inspired by today. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some other ways to connect with this series um, over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be holding an online discussion throughout this fortnight. Um, on our Gifford Lectures blog. This is led by Victoria Turner in New College. And to follow and contribute to the discussion, you can access the blog via the Gifford Lectures web pages. You're also very warmly invited to attend the Gifford Seminar being held on Wednesday, the 11th of May, next Wednesday, uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. at Rainy Hall in New College. Uh, again, the details are on the Gifford website. And just to remind you that Professor Neiman will continue her series tomorrow evening in the same room again at 5.30. And we're very much looking forward to the next lecture entitled Odysseus and his Critics, the First Modern Hero. So thank you all for coming. And can I ask you to thank once again our lecturer this evening.